So, Aaron, I know it's only been 24 hours since you and I spoke, but I woke up this morning and I saw on the Washington Post's website the most read story is one that you wrote, and it's about a question that a lot of people have been asking me about, which is, who is going to be Kamala Harris's running mate? And you have written a list of seven people. So I was like, I'm going to drag you in the studio (laughs) to talk to you about this. Yeah, I can be dragged into studios. Um, As a political journalist, you know, you're constantly in this bubble of people who are super interested in all of these things that are having to do with the campaign and politics more broadly. And then sometimes you start to hear from people who you don't usually hear from that are really interested in a given topic. And this has totally been one of those things, you know, hearing from the mothers of friends who are suddenly really interested in this topic. Oh, it's huge in the mom chats. Yes, exactly. Yes. I'm I'm hearing from lots of mothers around the country about this. And so here is your podcast, moms. We are going to explain it all for you, give you a nice primer so you can know what this process is going to look like moving forward. All right, let's get right into it then, Aaron. Let's do it. This is the campaign moment. It is Wednesday, July 24th. I'm Aaron Blake, senior political reporter and author of the campaign moment newsletter. Of course, your regular voice for political analysis on this podcast. And I'm Elahe Azadi, co-host of Post Reports. So Aaron, on yesterday's campaign moment, we did talk about some of the names floating around as possible picks for Kamala Harris as her running mate. And we're going to re-talk about a few of those. But now, you know, we have this list of seven picks that you've dug into. And just very quickly before we get into that list, there's a few caveats we should lay out. One is, of course, she's not officially the Democratic nominee, but she's all but sure to be there as early as next week. The entire party's behind her. She's been fundraising. She's locked up enough delegates. But there's just like a few other things we should say at the top before we really dig in. Yeah. And we just don't have a great sense right now for who's actually in consideration. Like this is always some somewhat of a speculative exercise. We're seeing conflicting reports about who's actually being vetted or submitted paperwork on that front. But we do have a general sense of like who makes sense, who might be being vetted and, and things like that. So it gives us somewhat of a basis to have this conversation on. So, yeah, in this case, you were considering what when you look at Harris and who would make sense for her. What were some of the things? A big thing is that she is the sitting vice president. She's also a former California senator, and she ran for president in 2020 on some pretty progressive policies. Um, And so Republicans are going to go after her for being from San Francisco and for the things she said on the 2020 campaign. She's got certain qualities and and assets that, you know, you might want to balance out with a running mate. And so all of that factors into this. And the other thing that I think is important here is one is that there is a compressed timeline. They need to figure this out quickly. And so there's a a premium on having a proven commodity. The other thing right now is that Democrats are so focused on winning right now because they were panicking just a few days ago. And so you you generally want to go with somebody who helps you in the campaign as opposed to somebody who's going to be more of a governing partner. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning that if she did win, she would be the first black female and Asian American president. So those are just some of the things in the mix here when we're talking about the people on this list. So given all of that, let's start here. Who could be a pick that could deliver Democrats a crucial swing state if we're talking about, you know, just trying to win politically here? Who's at the top of your list in that category? Yeah, so there's going to be some overlap on these, you know, qualifications that we're going to be talking about here. But when it comes to like a real crucial swing state, I see three names that fit that bill. Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, Arizona Senator Mark Kelly and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. All right. So that's three people. Let's start with Shapiro, who we talked about yesterday on the show. Why is he in this category? Yeah, certainly one of the buzziest um, candidates for this job. Pennsylvania probably is the most important swing state in the 2024 election for Democrats. It's got 19 electoral votes, which is more than a lot of others. It is just so crucial for their path to victory because they really need the Midwest. Shapiro is somebody who 
is relatively new to being a governor. He was just elected in 2022, but he was a state attorney general before then. He won big in 2022. He reached out to Trump supporters in rural areas of the state and has crafted a real bipartisan image. So somebody who would seem to be pretty broadly agreeable and and could kind of help um, Harris carry that state. The one poll that I keep coming back to on him is, and it's from earlier this year, it found that three in 10 Trump supporters in Pennsylvania also liked Josh Shapiro. And to the extent that you can have that kind of Is that of a appeal, good number? That's a really good number for okay. a Democrat. I mean, you usually see less than one in 10, okay. you know, Trump supporters who like Democrats. In this case, it was three in 10. That's a sign of like who he could appeal to. And, and even if it's just in Pennsylvania where these voters really like Josh Shapiro and it helps deliver those electoral votes, that would be huge for, for Vice President Harris. Okay, the other person you mentioned was Senator Kelly from Arizona, also a swing state, not as many electoral votes. Um, Tell me about him. Yeah, you know, I think Mark Kelly is somebody who has gotten a lot of attention in the last few days here. And the reason is that in addition to winning two Senate campaigns in Arizona, he won in 2020 and then a full term in 2022. So lots of recent campaign experience. Um, He's somebody whose profile, I think, could have lots of appeal for the Harris ticket. This is a former Navy combat pilot. He's a literal NASA astronaut. Um, He's (laughs) he's a husband. So he's smart. (laughs) Yes, he's smart. And, you know, you see him in his flight suit, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the campaign trail. Like you can see what the campaign literature is going to look like Uh, if he's on the ticket. And then the other thing that I think is worth noting here is he's the husband of Gabrielle Giffords, who, of course, a very sympathetic figure who was was shot in 2011 in Tucson in a mass shooting. So they've been focused somewhat on gun control issues since then. Just kind of a a very maybe less well-known nationally pick, but somebody who has a lot of uh, biography details that that have some appeal for a running mate. Got it. And then the other person you mentioned was Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan. Yeah, so Whitmer, I think, checks a lot of the same boxes that Shapiro does. She's been elected twice in Michigan, a swing state, and she's won both those campaigns by about 10 points. She's been pretty progressive, but has a a pretty bipartisan reputation as well. She's, I think, the one that a lot of people have been looking at as a potential frontrunner in 2028. I think there is a question about whether Democrats are going to put two women on the ticket, though. You know, they have a woman at the top of their ticket now. Polls show that Americans generally like the idea of electing a woman as president, but we've never done it before. You know, is it more of a hump for voters to get over to have two women on the ticket versus just one? I think that's certainly something that Democrats will at least be considering right now. Yeah, that's a big unknown. So, okay, Aaron, what if Democrats just want to go for the most standard issue experience politician? I'm thinking about 2008 when Obama picked Biden as his running mate. You know, he didn't pick other people. He picked someone who's been in politics and in the Senate for a very long time. Who would be the Biden of the moment? (laughs) Who would be the 2008 Biden? (laughs) Yeah. And by the way, Biden was also that candidate in the 2020 presidential race. Like Democrats were basically like, just give us the most standard issue politician that can win this campaign. And he he rose to the top eventually. I think in this in this process, that would be North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. He's been elected a lot more times than these names that we're mentioning. He's been in statewide office in North Carolina for basically the entire 21st century, first four terms as a state attorney general, and then two terms as governor. He's winding down his his term as governor, so he's term limited. I think what's really interesting about Cooper is he has won statewide in North Carolina in the very same elections that Republicans were winning the presidential race. Hmm. So North Carolina holds its statewide races the same year as presidential years. And so since the year 2000, Republicans have won that state five times while Roy Cooper was still winning his own race, first for attorney general, then for for governor. And that suggests that he does win people who are voting for Trump. He does win people who are voting for Republican presidential candidates. And then beyond that, if you're just kind of looking for like, the guy who looks the part of an experienced politician who's been around for a while, who's a little bit more seasoned. The 67-year-old governor of North Carolina, I think, kind of checks those boxes in a lot of ways. So I, I think if the name of the game is like making sure people feel like there's competence up and down the ticket, I think he makes a lot of sense. 
I'm wondering if the age is a drawback or if there's any other drawback of him that what's the but? Why not Roy Cooper? Yeah, you know, I think he has been somebody who's like often mentioned in the context of national campaigns, but he's never really stepped forward. Like uh. you see some of these candidates giving speeches in Iowa that, you know, put them on the map. We haven't really seen a whole lot of Roy Cooper on the national stage. And certainly you have to wonder like how he would actually play given he doesn't have that kind of experience. Maybe he just wants to actually retire, which would be <laughs> something unusual maybe for politicians these days. Okay, so I'm also wondering that and now we're up to four. So we've talked about four people. I'm wondering now if there's something to be said for not necessarily a swing state pick, which is all of these people so far, but someone who just shows that you have crossover appeal in a firmly red state. So who fits into that category? Yeah, so Roy Cooper has won kind of a red-leaning swing state over the mm -hmm. years, but there's really one candidate who has proven they can win in a red state, and that is Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, whose 2023 win was kind of the story of that election. There weren't many races, but this was a big one. He won re-election in a very red state. You know, Kentucky is a state that goes for Republican presidential candidates by around 20 points. He won by five points, and I think a key thing here is you know, candidates like Josh Shapiro and Gretchen Whitmer, they beat some kind of extreme Republicans who weren't very good nominees. Mm. Andy Bashir beat the sitting state attorney general who was a pretty consensus Republican establishment pick. And so it was a credit to him that he was able to win that race, even at a time when Democrats were trying to starting to fret about the 2024 election. I think there is a question with Bashir of like, a lot of times we see these candidates who win in tough states for their party and they kind of have to do things that don't really fit with their national party. So you see Northeastern Republican governors who are very, you know, pro-choice on abortion, but that doesn't fit with the national party. With Bashir, I think he's been, you know, pretty much in line with his party, but there are some compromises he's had to make. He hasn't been totally on board with his party when it comes to issues like climate change because Kentucky's a big coal state. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, he is a youthful pick. He is somebody with proven crossover appeal. But, you know, as far as like putting him into the campaign right now yeah. and knowing that he's going to do a good job, maybe not not quite as sold on that. Yeah. Okay, Aaron, let's just take a quick pause here and return with more names on this list, including some really true sleeper picks. We'll be right back. So, Aaron, I'm looking at my list, and so far we have talked about five of your seven picks here. So I am thinking, actually, about this compressed timeline. You know, which candidate could immediately just hit the ground running? Like, they don't need to warm up. It's just like, put me in, coach. Who is that person? <laughs> I think the one name on our list that comes from a blue state is Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, who maybe people don't know a whole lot about, but this is somebody who's been around Democratic politics for a long time. You know, his family has been involved in the party for many years. He's a billionaire, so they're donors. He was the co-chair of Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign. And then he got into politics himself, running for governor in 2018. What we've seen recently from Pritzker is that he's been kind of taking a lead role for the Biden and now Harris campaign as an attack dog against Donald Trump. And that's so he's been out there. Yeah, doing he's been this. out there doing this. And, you know, that's a big role for a running mate. And he's been doing it for a very long time. I do think that there are questions about, like, do you pick the governor of Illinois that can be tied to Chicago and also Pritzker, even in the 2022 election, like a lot of these other candidates did really well. And he won by 13 points, which isn't really that amazing in a blue state like Illinois mm. uh, against a pretty flawed opponent. So I don't know if he's necessarily the one you go to if you're looking for somebody who's going to expand the appeal of the ticket necessarily. Mm -hmm. So now we're up to six. I want to get to the seventh pick. And I think for the most part, we've talked about some names that maybe listeners have heard about. Who is the true sleeper pick for you, Aaron? 
Well, we're going to go to my home state and the state of vice presidents, um, Minnesota. Minnesota's, I love you love to make Minnesota it's happen. Got, it's you like... know, I have to talk about it. You know, Minnesota is like always, you know, we always talk about how we can't get a president, but we have had vice presidents, you know, Hubert yeah. Humphrey, Walter, That's not nothing. Walter Mondale. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think Minnesota Governor Tim Walls is somebody who makes sense on a couple fronts. He is... A guy who comes from the southern part of the state, he's got some rural roots. He's a former school teacher for two decades. He is a military veteran. This is somebody who's pretty affable and can kind of speak in terms that I think middle of the road voters would appreciate. Um, and also, he, as governor, especially the last couple of years when Democrats have gotten narrow majorities in the state legislature, Minnesota has done a lot of pretty progressive things for a pretty closely divided state. And so mm. I think he makes a lot of sense even from a governing standpoint in, in addition to the campaign. And so I would expect you're going to start to hear a little bit more about Tim Walls, even if you haven't heard much before. Well, and is the downside of him that maybe people haven't heard about him? So what does he really do, especially if it's not really like a swing state? Yeah, I mean, as far as who is going to get people super interested in this ticket, I don't Other necessarily— Other than Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that— For purely a, a political news reasons, not, not you know, we should be clear. <laughs> you know, I've like, I've I've actually written about the the hurdle that candidates from the upper Midwest face mm. in getting people excited about their campaigns. Tim Pawlenty, Scott Walker, like right. pretty milk toast Midwestern people. Like maybe that's not the top of the ticket thing, but maybe it is kind of a second in command and people appreciate that a little bit more. All right, Aaron, we've run through your seven people. Before I let you go, who else are folks talking about who else would you add to your list? Like, personally, I've heard a lot of chatter about the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg. What are his odds here? Yeah, I think keep Pete Buttigieg in your sights. He's somebody who's very good on the stump when it comes to going after Republicans and, and has been an effective messenger. A couple other names that I think are worth just keeping an eye on are Maryland Governor Wes Moore, maybe to a lesser extent, California Governor Gavin Newsom, Colorado Governor Jared Polis. Uh, who had some really interesting comments about this recently. He said, yeah. look, if if they do polling and it turns out they need a 49-year-old balding gay Jew from Boulder, Colorado, they've got my number. <laughs> well, at least he's <laughs> expressed interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and then, and then the last one that I think would be m m the most outside the box would be uh, retired Admiral William McRaven, who some mm. in the Democratic Party have, you know, what if we pick somebody from the military who, who you know, has a good profile? Uh, so those would be the other names that I would focus on. Wow. So, Aaron, just remind us, when should we expect real movement on this? Do we have a sense for, you know, how firm or how narrowed up this list could be? Why, why are people hearing different names? Just, just give me a sense of the timeline here. Yeah, so the Democratic National Committee does want to get this buttoned up by next week, the August 7th stated deadline for getting this ticket sorted out. It's less certain that they need the VP picked by then, um, but they've talked about it in those terms. In the coming days, keep an eye on, you know, whether we get some clarity on who's actually being vetted. If the list shrinks, you know, sometimes you get a longer list and then you get a short list. Uh, this is going to move pretty quickly and, and we'll certainly be keeping an eye on it. Yeah, and I wonder if some of it is just let's float these names out here, too, to see how people respond. There, There is the campaigns do that. So we're always asking ourselves, like, is this the actual list? And the campaigns have an incentive to put these names out there because the media helps vet them, too. And so generally, <laughs> yeah. you'll you'll get a pretty good picture from the media, too. Yeah, yeah. So, Aaron, just run down your seven again really quick here. So we have it in our minds in the coming days. Yeah, so keep an eye on Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, Minnesota Governor Tim Walls, and Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir. That's seven. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, we're going to pick all this back up on Friday's episode. Thank you, Aaron, for making time on a Wednesday to talk to me. Of course, and we'll do it all again on Friday. And in the meantime, make sure that you're subscribing to the Campaign Moment newsletter, which gives original, deep analysis of campaign news. And we pick the big moments like this one uh, to bring that to you. Uh, the link is going to be in the show notes, so make sure to open that link and subscribe. It would mean a lot to me and a lot to the team who uh, puts this together every single week. 
Yeah, it's so great. And if you're enjoying listening to the Campaign Moment, take a minute to tell a friend who you think would like it and show us some love with a rating on Spotify or a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or really all of the above. Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter at The Post, and I'm Elahe Izadi. Today's episode was mixed and produced by Renny Stranofsky with help from Laura Benshoff. It was edited by Renita Jablonski. Talk to you soon. There's a lot happening these days, but I have just the thing to get you up to speed on what matters without taking too much of your time. The 7 from the Washington Post is a podcast that gives you the seven most important and interesting stories, and we always try to save room for something fun. You get it all in about seven minutes or less. I'm Hannah Jewell. I'll get you caught up with The 7 every weekday. So follow The 7 right now. <laughs> 